Let's close our eyes for prayer. Talk to the Lord yourself. That God will help you to open your heart to receive instruction from Him tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. A great God in heaven, we thank you for coming together tonight. We thank you for what we have learned already. We pray that as we get more into your word, that you will assist us and help us to get the best from the word in Jesus' name. Help us, Lord, so that we will not be hearers only, but will be doers of the word. In Jesus' name we pray. In Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. In Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. The spirit of counsel and might. The spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. The Christian leader will often be called upon to give counsel to members of the church. And the counseling that we give is to point the right way. To the confused pilgrims who are at crossroads in their Christian journey. Somebody comes to a crossroad. He doesn't know what decision to take. He doesn't know which road to take. And then he needs our help. He needs our counseling. Counseling can either help or hinder the growth of the Christian. It can either build up or tear down. The ignorant, seeking believer. Jesus, as I read to you, has been referred to as the great counselor of his church. And I've read to you also that the Holy Spirit is the spirit of wisdom and counsel. And the whole Bible, the scripture, is the counsel of God. The conclusion from that is that it is only as we are full of the word of Christ... Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And it is as we are full of that word of Christ, and we are full of the spirit of truth, that we can counsel those who are seeking counseling from us according to the mind of God. This subject relates to the subject or to the message of counseling. And I have titled the message, The Fundamentals of biblical counseling. The Bible tells us that the blind cannot lead the blind. Neither can the natural man understand or discern spiritual things. Therefore, the natural man cannot counsel properly in a spiritual matter. Counseling is a delicate and sensitive ministry that we enter into with a sense of dependence upon the Lord, upon His Spirit, upon His wisdom, and upon His Word. Those who seek counseling have the responsibility of asking spiritual questions from the spiritually mature and divinely approved leaders in the church. And those who counsel must do it with the understanding that Eternal consequences, positive or negative, may attend the counseling that they give. Why do we make counseling a major ministry in the church? Why do we tell young believers, growing believers, and even those who are already in the service of the Lord, why do we impress it upon them that they should seek counseling? What's the foundation, the reason, the basis, the purpose for counseling? Proverbs chapter 11. In Proverbs chapter 11, reading from verse 14. 
where no counsel is, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. Where no counseling is, the people fall. If there is no counseling, many Christians will not be able to retain their Christian lives or the beauty of the grace of God in their lives. They will fall. They will not be able to make it finally to the desired end and destination. In Proverbs chapter 15, verse 22, without counsel, purposes are disappointed. Consecrations will not be fulfilled. The desire to serve the Lord till the very end, the purpose of heart to follow until the very end may not be accomplished. Therefore, without counsel, purposes are disappointed. But in the multitude of counselors, they are established. Proverbs chapter 24, verse 6. For by wise counsel thou shalt make war, and in the multitude of counselors there is safety. If there is anything to accomplish, if there is any kind of enterprise you want to get into, if there is any battle you want to fight, and you want to fight and you want to overcome, you need counseling. Because it says that it is only when there is that counseling that you will be able to make war successfully and you will be able to overcome. The average Christian in attempting to apply biblical teaching in his life, sometimes will need counseling. And there are seven reasons I want to give you why the average Christian will need counseling. Number one, a time comes when he is confused by conflicting thoughts and theories of men. And when such a time comes in your life, you need counseling. There is confusion. Because of the conflicting thoughts and the theories of men that are coming across your way. Number two, when he is uncertain of the steps to take in obeying God and doing his will. There are times a child of God knows that he ought to obey God. In fact, he even knows the area, he knows the area where he ought to obey God. The only problem is he doesn't know the steps he is going to take so that he will obey the Lord and it will give him a positive result and consequence when there is such uncertainty of the steps he ought to take then he ought to seek counseling number three he requires proper interpretation and application of difficult texts and passages of scripture there are times a believer will come across a passage of scripture that he finds difficult to understand, difficult to interpret, difficult to apply. At such a time, he'll be asking questions. He'll be seeking counseling. He wants to know what is the proper interpretation and the right application of this passage in my life. Number four, he is convicted and concerned about his inability to live an overcoming life. He has tried on his own all the methods he felt he knew that will help him to live the victorious life, the overcoming life. He has taken all those steps, and yet the victory he expects has not been granted unto him. And because he has come to the end of his journey, the end of his weeks, then he wants to seek counseling. He is concerned about his life. He is doing his best, and the best is not yielding a biblical result. Number five, when he needs guidance on the right choice of many possible options before him. He's thinking of doing a particular thing, and that thing is legitimate. But then there are various possibilities. There are different options. He could apply method A, or he could go in the direction of B, or it could go C, or it may be D. There are these options before him. 
and he doesn't know which exactly of these different options he ought to take. Because of that, he requires counseling. He wants to know which way he will go. Number six, he has some fears and some anxieties to resolve in his life. Yes, and these fears and anxieties are always making him to get confused, unhappy, discouraged, and it's not having, it's not allowing him to manifest positive faith, to follow the Lord without any distraction. And he wants to resolve these anxieties and fears in his life. Because of that, he seeks counseling. Number seven, he desires answers to some puzzles and perplexities hindering his spiritual growth. It might be that some things in his family life, that he is, he looks at his background of his father, of his mother, of the uncles, he sees some patterns in the extended family life. And he sees that although he is now a Christian, these things appear to still be affecting him. He is perplexed, he is puzzled, and he feels if you are a Christian, Shouldn't all these have been taken care of automatically? Because of the puzzle, because of the perplexity, he is not able to grow the way he ought to grow. Every decision he wants to make, every step he wants to take, every way he wants to go, is affected by the puzzle and by the perplexity troubling his mind. It is best for him at such a time to seek counseling. Now, when we seek counseling, what is it that counseling does for us? Number one, counseling opens the counselee's understanding to Scripture. Counseling opens the counselee's understanding to Scripture. In Luke chapter 24, Luke chapter 24, and in verse 45, and when, verse 45, then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. The disciples had been confused over an important matter. Jesus Christ had been betrayed. He had been crucified and he had died. Now he rose from the dead. And Jesus discovered that the disciples were discouraged. They were confused. They didn't know what to make of all this. How to relate everything that happened to Jesus Christ, relate everything back to Scripture. And now Jesus Christ opened their understanding that they might understand the Scriptures. The same thing, the counselor does. Somebody comes to you for counseling. You have to take the Scripture, open it up, interpret it, explain it, apply it. That the person will have understanding of scripture. Number two, counseling deals with the thorny issues in the inquirer's life in a balanced, comforting manner. Counseling will deal with thorny issues in the inquirer's life in a balanced, comforting manner. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 1 and 2. 1 Corinthians 7, verses 1 and 2. Now concerning the things whereof he wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Now these believers at Corinth, they had a thorny issue confronting them, troubling them. They sought counseling. And they wrote to Paul the Apostle. They wanted to know what to do, where to stand, what to believe, what to practice. Remember, I said on this number two, you are dealing with thorny issue in the inquirer's life. But you deal with it in a balanced, comforting manner. If you, were, if you stopped in verse one, the counseling is not complete. It is good for a man not to touch a woman. If you stopped there, you would have resolved partially the problem they had. But remember, it must be in a balanced way, in a comforting manner. 
the balance comes up in verse 2. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Sometimes you may say something good, but it's not complete. What you say may be good doctrine, sound doctrine, good practice, but it is not complete. If it is not complete, it is going to leave the counselee in confusion. And you are going to be given a heavy yoke, heavy burden, heavy load upon the counselee that you will not be able to bear. And so Paul the Apostle realized that. And he gave verse 1. He knew that if he stopped in verse 1, although it might be good, although you might have a lot of reasons why verse 1 is absolutely necessary in some situations, and yet, it will become a burden, a load, upon the people that are seeking the counseling. Therefore, it balances it up for the counselee in verse 2. Nevertheless, although this is good, although this is right, although these, we might call it consecration, although these might be what others will recommend and make it absolute and stop there, nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. Number three, counseling guides us into true interpretation and application of God's word, thereby bringing salvation, restoration, and spiritual growth. That you will find in Acts chapter 8. Write it down, there will be, we don't have enough time to read all the references. Acts chapter 8, verses 30 to 39. The Ethiopian eunuch asked the question, Is the one who wrote this thing I'm reading, did he write about himself or about another one? And then he was guided. How can I understand? Except someone should guide me. Counseling is to guide us. To guide us into the true interpretation and application of God's word. Number four, it is to restore erring counselee. The person who comes for counseling might have erred. He might have gone astray. And our counseling is to restore the erring counselee. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Somebody comes for counseling. Or maybe the person has not come for counseling. You discover that he needs counseling. And therefore you call him. And you want to counsel him. You want to gently lead him. You want to restore him. If you see that he has gone astray, counseling is to restore the erring counselee. Number five, counseling is to strengthen the faith of the weak. Strengthen the faith of the weak. In Second Timothy chapter 1, verses 6, and seven. Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by, by the putting on of my hands. Here Paul was writing to Timothy. He had told him in, chap, in uh, chapter 4 of the fourth epistle that he should be an example of the believers in word in conversation, and in charity, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. He had told him in that same chapter 4 that he should take heed unto himself and take heed unto the doctrine, that he is take heed unto his teaching, unto his ministry. Then he had told him also that he should stop the mouths of some people. Now to do all that, he knew that Timothy had a problem. He needed some encouragement. He needed some counseling. So he now wrote a second epistle to him. And he told him, I want to put you in remembrance. That you stir up the gift of God in you. And then in verse 7, 
For God has not given us the spirit of fear. Obviously, Timothy was having a hard time with timidity and with fear. And now he counseled him to strengthen him, to encourage him, to build up his faith, to reassure him. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Number six, counseling holds up. A biblical model before the counselee to follow. When you counsel people, you make sure that in your counselling, you will hold up a biblical model to follow. Sometimes as you give counselling, the people you are counselling may be wondering in their mind whether what you are telling them is possible or not. How possible is it for me to do that kind of restitution? How possible is it for me to deny myself in such a way? How possible is it for me to so discipline my life that I will live such a life of righteousness? And they will be wondering in their mind, as you are counseling, you will see that look of uncertainty, of doubt, of lack of assurance on their facial expression. And then in your counseling, you will hold up before them a biblical model so that they will know what to follow. In Romans chapter 12 and verse 9. Romans chapter 12, verse 9. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. The model you hold before them will assure them that they are to follow the right way. Number seven, counseling warns the unruly. We cannot encourage somebody who has been unruly, somebody who has been mischievous, somebody who is deliberately rebellious. Our counseling will warn such an individual. That's in First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 14. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 14, now number 8. Counseling teaches and instructs the ignorant and the deceived. There are times you'll find that the people who come for counseling, they have been deceived by false prophets. They are holding on to false doctrine. They are following a false practice, but they do not know. And therefore your counseling will teach them, will instruct them of their way of ignorance, of the deception they have swallowed up without being aware of it, so that you'll be able to recover them from their way of error. In Second Timothy chapter 2, Second Timothy chapter 2, from verse 25. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. There are people that come for counseling. And while they are before you uh, seeking counseling, you will discover that ignorantly, they are opposing themselves. They are contradicting themselves. They are destroying their own very lives. And therefore, patiently, with love, wanting to rescue them from the way of error, you will instruct those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. Number nine. Counseling will stir up the lukewarm, the discouraged, to godly action. Your counseling will stir up the lukewarm and the discouraged to godly action. Number 10, counseling provides solution to perplexing questions that can hinder spiritual growth. Counseling provides solution to perplexing questions that can hinder spiritual growth. Look at John chapter 16. John chapter 16. Reading from verse 16. John 16, 
16. A little while, and ye shall not see me. And again, a little while, and ye shall see me, because I go to the Father. Then said some of his disciples among themselves, What is this that he says unto us? A little while, and ye shall not see me. And again, a little while, and ye shall see me, because I go unto the Father. They said, Therefore, what is this that he says a little while? We cannot tell what he says. These were the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. He had told them about his departure and about his return. Then they began to question among themselves. A little while, I'm here. A little while, I'll not be here. A little while, you see me. A little while, you will not see me. What is the significance and the meaning of what he's saying? The Lord knew that they needed counseling. And when members of the church, when they are questioning and wondering, what could he mean? What could that statement infer? What can we infer from that statement? This uh, teaching we are receiving, how can we apply it? And there is a sense of perplexity and confusion. Then you know that counseling is necessary. Verse 19. Now Jesus knew that they were desirous to ask him. And said unto them, Do ye inquire among yourselves? Of that I said, a little while, and ye shall not see me, and again a little while, and ye shall see me. Verily, verily, I say unto you, that ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice, and ye shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. Then he went on talking to them about his departure. And as he spoke to them, eventually they understood. Verse 29, his disciples said unto him, Lo, now speakest thou plainly, and speakest no proverb. You see, they had been confused. But answering the question, explaining things to them, counseling them, pointing the way to them, made them to say, now we understand. Now it is not a parable. Now it is not a proverb. Now you are speaking plainly. Number 11. Counseling explains the clear line of action to be taken. And warns of the danger of disobedience. You see, counseling is like a two-edged sword. On the one hand, you show very clearly the path to be taken. On the other hand, you warn of the danger of disobedience that you will find in Genesis chapter 20, verse 7. Number 12. Counseling confirms the truth already believed. There are times that people who come to us for counseling, they already have the right idea. They already know what to be done. But they are doubting, am I taking things too far? Am I just uh, making a heavy burden, a heavy load for myself to carry? Is it necessary that this is what I should do? I think I should do it. I think I should go this direction. But I see some Christians who don't worry about this. Well, let me go for counseling. Less I'm the one that is taking things too far. He comes for counseling. And the counseling you give him will confirm the truth which already he has believed. Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. From verse 2. And I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that, that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, and but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or are drawn in vain. So then, counseling is to guide is to strengthen, is to instruct, is to warn, is to encourage, is to resolve doubts, is to lead in the way of righteousness. I know that some of you might feel that we are taking long on this, but this is the very center of our ministry. If we miss out on proper counseling, we might lose many lives from the kingdom of God. That's why it's very important we look at this very seriously. Counseling, that is dealing with and resolving problems for members of the congregation, is an important part of the pastor's or the leader's ministry. 
It is our duty to guide the misled, to inspire the zealous, to comfort the sorrowful, to restore the backslider, to strengthen the weak, to encourage the fearful, to warn the unruly, and to establish disciples in the truth. That is going to require from the counselor much knowledge, much wisdom, much love for the truth, and much love for the people. The counselor must be a man or a woman of tenderness as well as firmness. A man or woman of unction and in feeling of the Holy Spirit to counsel in a divinely approved way. If our counseling does not please God, the counselees are not being helped at all. The consequence is that our blood, their blood will be upon the counselors. What procedure do you take then? So you can counsel in a biblical way. Number one, demonstrate genuine compassion and concern for the one you are counseling. Number two, be a good listener. You don't know their problems. They are going to talk you about their problems. You don't know what is paining them. Even if you know the problem, you do not know the aspect of the problem that is bringing conflict in their lives. Be a good listener. Number three, encourage the counselee to be open and to be honest with God and honest with you about his viewpoints, his insight, his behavior, his knowledge, is understanding of the matter. Number three, use questions to discover what their convictions and expectations are. Ask questions like, what do you mean by this? Ask questions like, you said this happened. What happened after that? Ask questions like, that person offended you. How did you feel about it? You ask questions like, this problem you are relating to me has been on now for these years. What's your, con uh, what's your conviction now about it? You are saying that so and so stepped on your toes. What do you think about him? Or ask questions like, if I called your husband here now, would you be willing that he also should contribute his part into the discussion? Or do you want it privately dealt with? Ask questions like, does your wife know about this thing you are discussing about? Ask questions like, this thing you have against your child. Is he conscious that you have this point against him or against her? This uh, thing you say they are cheating in your place of work. Do the people know they are not giving you your rights? Ask questions that will make them to open up and then lead them into uh, being able to so open up you will understand the whole truth about the problem. And then you gently challenge them to evaluate their convictions and their expectations. Number five, be very patient with the counselee. Very, very patient. Be willing to gently repeat and go over the same material again and again. Number six, bring scripture with proper interpretation and application to deal directly with the problem. You will not just counsel up your head for memory. You will not just say, go and do this, go and do this, go and do that. You will refer back to scripture. And the scripture will not be quoted out of context. You will make sure it is scripture that is within the context of what we are talking about. Number seven. Constantly bring God into the picture. Enlarge the person's concept of the power, the wisdom, the mercy, the grace, the love of God towards them. Make sure that you are enlarging their concept about the faithfulness and the goodness of God. Number eight, encourage the person to have a God-centered hope and a Christ-centered hope. Hope in God, not hope in people, not to hope in circumstances, not to hope in self. Number nine, give clear instruction and use vivid illustrations to drive home the truth concerning the root cause of the revealed problems. Number ten, Help the counselee to learn how to have meaningful fellowship with God. Number 11. Make much 
of the doctrine and experience of justification by grace through faith. And of the centrality and the indispensability of holiness of heart and life. Number twelve, help them to understand that difficulties and trials and persecutions and challenges are part of life on this side of heaven. There's nothing strange in the persecutions we have, in the trials we have, in the difficulties we have. Count it not strange, brethren, when you fall into diverse temptations and trials. Number thirteen. Encourage them to live by faith, not by feeling. To pray sincerely, scripturally, and seriously, and not to faint. Encourage them to keep on moving on, because the Lord will support them. 14. Pray with them, and continue to pray for them after they have gone, until God's purpose is realized in them, and realized through them. Number 15. Discipline yourself and refrain from using the counselor's information about himself. Refrain from using the counselor's information about herself in any discussion, private or in public preaching. Very important. Do not use that illustration. She might be there, she might overhear. Do not use it. He might be there. He might overhear. And that will discourage him. Don't use the information the husband gave you when you are talking to the wife. Don't use the one the wife gave you when you are talking to the husband. Counseling is a very delicate matter. You can ruin those people by making use of the information to the people that will say, Ah, that's what my wife said. That's what my husband said. Or if you preach over the pulpit, and then the people in the church, they look in the same direction. They look at that person, and they say, that is that fellow. Let us be very careful. You want to have the counseling ministry to help, not to destroy. Number 16, be a model of purity. A sister comes to a man for counseling. Let that sister feel purer, holier, leaving you than before she came. What you discuss what you say, your choice of words, the things that go on there, let that sister know that this is a model of purity. And if you are a sister, sometimes a brother will come to a sister because they respect you and because they appreciate you. They have known your life, they have known you for a long time and they know you are one of the key leaders in the church and they feel that I believe this sister will help me in this issue and they come to you. There is no hard and fast rule. That a brother cannot come to a sister, or a sister cannot go to a brother. Generally, we want the sisters to go to the sisters. And we do not want our main counselors, our main coordinators, to hinder the sisters in the church, any sister in the church, from seeing the women coordinator in the district, or from seeing the women representative in the district. And you say, the reason we stop them is that we know that that sister is not matured. Why do we make her woman rare? If she's not matured to be a woman rare, tell her and replace her. If she's a woman rare, if she's a woman coordinator, she should be able to do her work. Let the sisters go to her. And brothers will go to brothers. But there are times when a sister will go to a brother. Or when a brother will go to a sister. But let us make sure that we are models of purity and of holiness before the counseling, during the counseling, and after the counseling. And I believe that if we do this, the Lord will help our ministry of counseling in Jesus' name. And I believe that we, as leaders in the church, will be able to lead people aright in this sensitive area of counseling. Let me close with this uh, reference of the Bible, Isaiah chapter 8. Isaiah chapter 8. On your own, you can read James chapter 1, verse 19 later. Also, you may want to read Matthew chapter 7, verses 5 and 6. Also, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 5 to 12. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 5 to 12. Numbers 
chapter 22 verse 38 John chapter 8 verses 29 and 30 so you can't sell after the mind of God now Isaiah chapter 8 verse 20 to the law and to the testimony if they speak not according to this word it is because there is no light in them when we go for counseling, all that they tell us in the counseling, we must compare with the word of God with the Bible. When we counsel, all we tell the counselees, we must compare with the word of God. We must compare with the Bible to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord on this important subject of counseling. It's been a Bible teaching, not preaching. And you've seen areas where we need counseling. You've seen the importance of counseling in the church. Let's talk to the Lord that the Lord will help us. That we as leaders in the church, we will be able to make use of the word of God and counsel needy people aright.